Pope John XXIII Latin, Ioannis, Italian, Giovanni, born Angelo Giuseppe Rincalli, Italian pronunciation, Andello du Paro Cali, 25 November 1881 – 3 June 1963 was head of the Catholic Church and sovereign of the Vatican City State from 28 October 1958 to his death in 1963, he was canonized on 27 April 2014. Angelo Giuseppe Rincalli was the fourth of fourteen children born to a family of sharecroppers who lived in a village in Lombardy. He was ordained to the priesthood on 10 August 1904 and served in a number of posts, as nuncio in France and a delegate to Bulgaria, Greece and Turkey. In a consistory on 12 January 1953 Pope Pius XII made Rincalli a cardinal as the cardinal priest of Santa Prisca in addition to naming him as the Patriarch of Venice. Rincalli was unexpectedly elected Pope on 28 October 1958 at age 76 after 11 ballots. Pope John XXIII surprised those who expected him to be a caretaker Pope by calling the historic Second Vatican Council 1962 the first session opening on of October 1962. His passionate views on equality were summed up in his statement, We were all made in God's image, and thus, we are all godly alike. John XXIII made many passionate speeches during his pontificate. He made a major impact on the Catholic Church, opening it up to dramatic unexpected changes promulgated at the Vatican Council and by his own dealings with other churches and nations. In Italian politics, he prohibited bishops from interfering with local elections, and he helped the Christian Democratic Party to cooperate with the Socialists. In international affairs, his Ostpolitik engaged in dialogue with the communist countries of Eastern Europe. He especially reached out to the Eastern Orthodox churches. His overall goal was to modernize the church by emphasizing its pastoral role, and its necessary involvement with affairs of state. He dropped the traditional rule of 70 cardinals, increasing the size to 85. He used the opportunity to name the first cardinals from Africa, Japan, and the Philippines. He promoted ecumenical movements in cooperation with other Christian faiths. In doctrinal matters, he was a traditionalist, but he ended the practice of automatically formulating social and political policies on the basis of old theological propositions. He did not live to see the Vatican Council to completion. His cause for canonization was opened on the 18th of November 1965 by his successor, Pope Paul VI, who declared him a servant of God. On 5 July 2013, Pope Francis, bypassing the traditionally required second miracle, declared John XXIII a saint, based his virtuous, model lifestyle, and because of the good which had come from his having opened the Second Vatican Council. He was canonized alongside Pope John Paul II on 27 April 2014. John XXIII today is affectionately known as the Good Pope, and in Italian, Il Papa Buono. Topic. Biography Topic. Early life and ordination Angelo Giuseppe Rincalli was born on 25 November 1881 in Sato il Monte, a small country village in the Bergamo province of the Lombardy region of Italy. He was the eldest son of Giovanni Battista Rincalli (1854–1935) and his wife Mariana Giulia Mazzola (1855–20 February 1939), and fourth in a family of thirteen. His siblings were Maria Caterina (1877–1883), Teresa (1879–1954), Anchila (1880–11 November 1953). Francesco Zaverio (1883–1976), Maria Elisa (1884–1955), Asunta Casilda Marchesi (1886–23 March 1980), Domenico Giuseppe (the 22nd of February 1888 to the 14th of March 1888), Alfredo (1889–1972), Giovanni Francesco (1891–1956). Enrica 1893 to 1918 Giuseppe Luigi 1894 to 1981 Luigi 1896 to 1898 his family worked as sharecroppers as did most of the people of Sato il Monte a striking contrast to that of his predecessor Eugenio Pacelli Pope Pius XII who came from an ancient aristocratic family long connected to the papacy 
Rincalli was nonetheless a descendant of an Italian noble family, albeit from a secondary and impoverished branch. In 1889, Rincalli received both his first communion and confirmation at the age of eight. On 1 March 1896, Luigi Isacchi, the spiritual director of his seminary, enrolled him into the secular Franciscan order. He professed his vows as a member of that order on 23 May 1897. In 1904, Rincalli completed his doctorate in canon law and was ordained a priest in the Catholic Church of Santa Maria in Monte Santo in Piazza del Popolo in Rome on 10 August. Shortly after that, while still in Rome, Rincalli was taken to St. Peter's Basilica to meet Pope Pius X. After this, he would return to his town to celebrate Mass for the Assumption. Topic. Priesthood In 1905, Giacomo Radini Tedeschi, the new Bishop of Bergamo, appointed Rincalli as his secretary. Rincalli worked for Radini Tedeschi until the bishop's death on the 22nd of August 1914, two days after the death of Pope Pius X. Radini Tedeschi's last words to Rincalli were, "Angelo, pray for peace." The death of Radini Tedeschi had a deep effect on Rincalli. During this period, Rincalli was also a lecturer in the diocesan seminary in Bergamo. During World War I, Rincalli was drafted into the Royal Italian Army as a sergeant, serving in the medical corps as a stretcher bearer and as a chaplain. After being discharged from the army in early 1919, he was named spiritual director of the seminary. On 6 November 1921, Rincalli traveled to Rome where he was scheduled to meet the Pope. After their meeting, Pope Benedict XV appointed him as the Italian president of the Society for the Propagation of the Faith. Rincalli would recall Benedict XV as being the most sympathetic of the popes he had met. Episcopate In February 1925, the Cardinal Secretary of State Pietro Gasperi summoned him to the Vatican and informed him of Pope Pius XI's decision to appoint him as the Apostolic Visitor to Bulgaria 1925-1935. On 3 March, Pius XI also named him for consecration as titular Archbishop of Areopolis, Jordan. Rincalli was initially reluctant about a mission to Bulgaria, but he would soon relent. His nomination as Apostolic Visitor was made official on 19 March. Rincalli was consecrated by Giovanni Tacci Porcelli in the Church of San Carlo alla Corso in Rome. After he was consecrated, he introduced his family to Pope Pius XI. He chose as his episcopal motto Obedientia et Pax, obedience and peace, which became his guiding motto. While he was in Bulgaria, an earthquake struck in a town not too far from where he was. Unaffected, he wrote to his sisters Ankila and Maria and told them both that he was fine. On 30 November 1934, he was appointed apostolic delegate to Turkey and Greece and titular Archbishop of Mesambria, Bulgaria. Thus, he is known as the Turkophile Pope, by the Turkish society which is predominantly Muslim. Rincalli took up this post in 1935 and used his office to help the Jewish underground in saving thousands of refugees in Europe, leading some to consider him to be a righteous Gentile see Pope John XXIII and Judaism. In October 1935, he led Bulgarian pilgrims to Rome and introduced them to Pope Pius XI on the 14th of October. In February 1939, he received news from his sisters that his mother was dying. On the 10th of February 1939, Pope Pius XI died. Rincalli was unable to see his mother for the end as the death of a pontiff meant that he would have to stay at his post until the election of a new pontiff. Unfortunately, she died on 20 February 1939, during the nine days of mourning for the late Pius XI. He was sent a letter by Cardinal Eugenio Pacelli, and Rincalli later recalled that it was probably the last letter Pacelli sent until his election as Pope Pius XII on 2 March 1939. Rincalli expressed happiness that Pacelli was elected, and, on radio, listened to the coronation of the new pontiff. Rincalli remained in Bulgaria at the time that World War II commenced, optimistically writing in his journal in April 1939, I don't believe we will have a war. At the time that the war did in fact commence, he was in Rome, meeting with Pope Pius XII on 5 September 1939. In 1940, Rincalli was asked by the Vatican to devote more of his time to Greece, therefore, he made several visits there in January and May that year. 
Nuncio. On the 22nd of December 1944, during World War II, Pope Pius XII named him to be the new Apostolic Nuncio to recently liberated France. In this capacity he had to negotiate the retirement of bishops who had collaborated with the German occupying power. Rincalli was chosen among several other candidates, one of whom was Archbishop Joseph Fieta. Rincalli met with Domenico Tardini to discuss his new appointment, and their conversation suggested that Tardini did not approve of it. One curial prelate referred to Rincalli as an old fogey. While speaking with a journalist, Rincalli appointed a 33rd degree Freemason, the Baron Yves Marsaden, as head of the French branch of the Knights of Malta, a Catholic lay order. Rincalli left Ankara on the 27th of December 1944 on a series of short haul flights that took him to several places, such as Beirut, Cairo, and Naples. He ventured to Rome on the 28th of December and met with both Tardini and his friend Giovanni Battista Montini. He left for France the next day to commence his newest role. Topic. Efforts during the Holocaust As nuncio, Rincalli made various efforts during the Holocaust in World War II to save refugees, mostly Jewish people, from the Nazis. Among his efforts were Delivery of immigration certificates to Palestine through the Nunciature Diplomatic Courier Rescue of Jews by means of certificates of Baptism of Convenience sent by Monsignor Rincalli to priests in Europe. Slovakian children managed to leave the country due to his interventions. Jewish refugees whose names were included on a list submitted by Rabbi Marcus of Istanbul to Nuncio Rincalli. Jews held at Jasonovic concentration camp, near Stara Gradiska, were liberated as a result of his intervention. Bulgarian Jews who left Bulgaria, a result of his request to King Boris III of Bulgaria. Romanian Jews from Transnistria left Romania as a result of his intervention. Italian Jews helped by the Vatican as a result of his interventions. Orphaned children of Transnistria on board a refugee ship that weighed anchor from Constanza to Istanbul, and later arriving in Palestine as a result of his interventions. Jews held at the Serd concentration camp who were spared from being deported to German death camps as a result of his intervention. Hungarian Jews who saved themselves through their conversions to Christianity through the baptismal certificate sent by Nuncio Rincalli to the Hungarian Nuncio, Monsignor Angelo Roda. In 1965, the Catholic Herald newspaper quoted Pope John XXIII as saying, We are conscious today that many, many centuries of blindness have cloaked our eyes so that we can no longer see the beauty of thy chosen people nor recognize in their faces the features of our privileged brethren. We realize that the mark of Cain stands upon our foreheads. Across the centuries our brother Abel has lain in blood which we drew, or shed tears we caused by forgetting thy love. Forgive us for the curse we falsely attached to their name as Jews. Forgive us for crucifying thee a second time in their flesh. For we know not what we did. On 7 September 2000, the International Raoul Wallenberg Foundation launched the international campaign for the acknowledgement of the humanitarian actions undertaken by Vatican Nuncio Angelo Giuseppe Rincalli for people, most of whom were Jewish, persecuted by the Nazi regime. The launching took place at the Permanent Observation Mission of the Vatican to the United Nations, in the presence of Vatican State Secretary Cardinal Angelo Sodano. The International Raoul Wallenberg Foundation has carried out exhaustive historical research related to different events connected with interventions of Nuncio Rincalli in favor of Jewish refugees during the Holocaust. Until now, three reports have been published compiling different studies and materials of historical research about the humanitarian actions carried out by Rincalli when he was nuncio. In 2011, the International Raoul Wallenberg Foundation submitted a massive file the Rincalli dossier to Yad Vashem, with a strong petition and recommendation to bestow upon him the title of righteous among the nations. Topic. Relations with Israel After 1944 he played an active role in gaining Catholic Church support for the establishment of the State of Israel. His support for Zionism and the establishment of Israel was the result of his cultural and religious openness toward other faiths and cultures, and especially concern with the fate of Jews after the war. He one of the Vatican's most sympathetic diplomats toward Jewish illegal immigration to Palestine, which he saw as a humanitarian issue, and not a matter of biblical theology. 
Topic: Cardinal. Rincalli received a message from MGR Montini on the 14th of November 1952, asking him if he would want to become the new Patriarch of Venice in light of the nearing death of Carlo Agostini. Furthermore, Montini said to him via letter on 29 November 1952 that Pius XII had decided to raise him to the Cardinalate. Rincalli knew that he would be appointed to lead the Patriarchy of Venice due to the death of Agostini, who was to have been raised to the rank of Cardinal. On 12 January 1953, he was appointed Patriarch of Venice and raised to the rank of Cardinal Priest of Santa Prisca by Pope Pius XII. Rincalli left France for Venice on 23 February 1953 stopping briefly in Milan and then to Rome. On 15 March 1953, he took possession of his new diocese in Venice. As a sign of his esteem, the President of France, Vincent Auriel, claimed the ancient privilege possessed by French monarchs and bestowed the Red Beretta on Rincalli at a ceremony in the Elysee Palace. It was around this time that he, with the aid of Monsignor Bruno Heim, formed his coat of arms with a lion of St. Mark on a white ground. Oriel also awarded Rincalli three months later with the award of Commander of the Legion of Honor. Rincalli decided to live on the second floor of the residence reserved for the Patriarch, choosing not to live in the first floor room once resided in by Giuseppe Melchiore Sarto, who later became Pope Pius X. On 29 May 1954, the late Pius X was canonized and Rincalli ensured that the late pontiff's patriarchal room was remodeled into a 1903 the year of the new saint's papal election look in his honor. With Pius X's few surviving relatives, Rincalli celebrated a mass in his honor. His sister Anquila would soon be diagnosed with stomach cancer in the early 1950s. Rincalli's last letter to her was dated on 8 November 1953 where he promised to visit her within the next week. He could not keep that promise, as Anquila died on of November 1953 at the time when he was consecrating a new church in Venice. He attended her funeral back in his hometown. In his will around this time, he mentioned that he wished to be buried in the crypt of St. Mark's in Venice with some of his predecessors rather than with the family in Sato il Monte. Topic. Papacy Topic. Papal election Following the death of Pope Pius XII on 9 October 1958, Rincalli watched the live funeral on his last full day in Venice on of October. His journal was specifically concerned with the funeral and the abused state of the late pontiff's corpse. Rincalli left Venice for the conclave in Rome well aware that he was Papabile, and after eleven ballots, was elected to succeed the late Pius XII, so it came as no surprise to him, though he had arrived at the Vatican with a return train ticket to Venice. Many had considered Giovanni Battista Montini, the Archbishop of Milan, a possible candidate, but, although he was the Archbishop of one of the most ancient and prominent sees in Italy, he had not yet been made a cardinal. Though his absence from the 1958 conclave did not make him ineligible, under canon law any Catholic male who is capable of receiving priestly ordination and episcopal consecration may be elected. The College of Cardinals usually chose the new pontiff from among the cardinals who attend the papal conclave. At the time, as opposed to contemporary practice, the participating cardinals did not have to be below age 80 to vote, there were few Eastern Rite cardinals, and some cardinals were just priests at the time of their elevation. Rincalli was summoned to the final ballot of the conclave at 4 p.m. He was elected pope at 4.30 p.m. with a total of 38 votes. After the long pontificate of Pope Pius XII, the cardinals chose a man who, it was presumed because of his advanced age, would be a short-term or stop-gap. Pope. They wished to choose a candidate who would do little during the new pontificate. Upon his election, Cardinal Eugene Tisserant asked him the ritual questions of whether he would accept and if so, what name he would take for himself. Rincalli gave the first of his many surprises when he chose John as his regnal name. Rincalli's exact words were, I will be called John. This was the first time in over 500 years that this name had been chosen. Previous popes had avoided its use since the time of the antipope John XXIII during the Western Schism several centuries before. On the choice of his papal name, Pope John XXIII said to the cardinals, I choose John. A name sweet to us because it is the name of our Father, dear to me because it is the name of the humble parish church where I was baptized, the solemn name of numberless cathedrals scattered throughout the world, including our own Basilica Street. 
John Lateran. 22 Johns of indisputable legitimacy have been Pope, and almost all had a brief pontificate. We have preferred to hide the smallness of our name behind this magnificent succession of Roman popes. Upon his choosing the name, there was some confusion as to whether he would be known as John the 23rd or John the 24th. In response, he declared that he was John the 23rd, thus affirming the antipopal status of antipope John the 23rd. Before this antipope, the most recent popes called John were John the 22nd, 1316 to 34, and John the 21st, 1276 to 77. However, there was no Pope John the 20th, owing to confusion caused by medieval historians misreading the Liber Pontificalis to refer to another Pope John between John the 14th and John the 15th. After his election, he confided in Cardinal Maurice Felton that he had chosen the name in memory of France and in the memory of John the 22nd, who continued the history of the papacy in France. After he answered the two ritual questions, the traditional Habemus Papam announcement was delivered by Cardinal Nicola Canali to the people at 6.08 p.m., an exact hour after the white smoke appeared. A short while later, he appeared on the balcony and gave his first Urbi et Orbi blessing to the crowds of the faithful below in St. Peter's Square. That same night, he appointed Domenico Tardini as his Secretary of State. Of the three cassocks prepared for whomever the new pope was, even the largest was not enough to fit his five-foot-two, two-hundred-plus-pound frame, which had to be let out in certain places and only to be held together with great effort by bobby pins. When he first saw himself in the mirror in his new vestments, he said with an apprising and critical look that, This man will be a disaster on television. While later saying he felt his first appearance before the globe was as if he were a newborn babe in swaddling clothes. His coronation took place on 4 November 1958, on the feast of St. Charles Borromeo, and it occurred on the central loggia of the Vatican. He was crowned with the 1877 Palatine Tiara. His coronation ran for the traditional five hours. In John XXIII's first consistory on 15 December of that same year, Montini was created a cardinal and would become John XXIII's successor in 1963, taking the name of Paul VI. Following his election the new pope told the tale of how in his first weeks he was walking when he heard a woman exclaim in a loud voice, My God, he's so fat! The new pope casually remarked, Madam, the holy conclave isn't exactly a beauty contest. Topic. Visits around Rome On 25 December 1958, he became the first pope since 1870 to make pastoral visits in his Diocese of Rome, when he visited children infected with polio at the Bambino Gesù Hospital and then visited Santo Spirito Hospital. The following day, he visited Rome's Regina Celli Prison, where he told the inmates, You could not come to me, so I came to you. These acts created a sensation, and he wrote in his diary. Great astonishment in the Roman, Italian and international press. I was hemmed in on all sides, authorities, photographers, prisoners, wardens. During these visits, John XXIII put aside the normal papal use of the formal, we, when referring to himself, such as when he visited a reformatory school for juvenile delinquents in Rome telling them, I have wanted to come here for some time. The media noticed this and reported that, he talked to the youths in their own language. Topic. Ostpolitik and Eastern Europe In international affairs, his Ostpolitik Eastern policy engaged in dialogue with the communist countries of Eastern Europe. He worked to reconcile the Vatican with the Russian Orthodox Church to settle tensions between the local churches. The Second Vatican Council did not condemn communism and did not even mention it, in what some have called a secret agreement between the Holy See and the Soviet Union. In Passum in Terrace, John XXIII also sought to prevent nuclear war and tried to improve relations between the Soviet Union and the United States. He began a policy of dialogue with Soviet leaders in order to seek conditions in which Eastern Catholics could find relief from persecution. Relations with Jews One of the first acts of Pope John XXIII, in 1960, was to eliminate the description of Jews as perfidious Latin for perfidious or faithless in the prayer for the conversion of the Jews in the Good Friday liturgy. 
He interrupted the first Good Friday liturgy in his pontificate to address this issue when he first heard a celebrant refer to the Jews with that word. He also made a confession for the Church of the Sin of Antisemitism through the centuries. While Vatican II was being held, John XXIII tasked Cardinal Augustine B with the creation of several important documents that pertain to reconciliation with Jewish people. Topic. Calling the Council Far from being a mere stopgap pope, to great excitement, John XXIII called for an ecumenical council fewer than 90 years after the First Vatican Council Vatican I's predecessor, the Council of Trent, had been held in the 16th century. This decision was announced on 25 January 1959 at the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls. Cardinal Giovanni Battista Montini, who later became Pope Paul VI, remarked to Giulio Bevilacqua that, "...this holy old boy doesn't realize what a hornet's nest he's stirring up." From the Second Vatican Council came changes that reshaped the face of Catholicism, a comprehensively revised liturgy, a stronger emphasis on ecumenism, and a new approach to the world. Prior to the first session of the Council, John XXIII visited Assisi and Loreto on 4 October 1962 to pray for the new upcoming Council as well as to mark the feast day of St. Francis of Assisi. He was the first Pope to travel outside of Rome since Pope Pius IX. Along the way, there were several halts at Orte, Narni, Terna, Spoleto, Foligno, Fabriano, Iesi, Falconara and Ancona where the crowds greeted him. Topic. Moral theology Topic. Contraception In 1963, John XXIII established a commission of six non-theologians to investigate questions of birth control. Topic. Human rights John XXIII was an advocate for human rights which included the unborn and the elderly. He wrote about human rights in his Passum in Terrace. He wrote, Man has the right to live. He has the right to bodily integrity and to the means necessary for the proper development of life, particularly food, clothing, shelter, medical care, rest, and, finally, the necessary social services. In consequence, he has the right to be looked after in the event of ill health, disability stemming from his work, widowhood, old age, enforced unemployment, or whenever through no fault of his own he is deprived of the means of livelihood. <laughs> divorce In regards to the topic of divorce, John XXIII said that human life is transmitted through the family which is founded on the sacrament of marriage and is both one and indissoluble as a union in God, therefore, it is against the teachings of the Church for a married couple to divorce. <laughs> Pope John XXIII and Papal Ceremonial Pope John XXIII was the last pope to use full papal ceremony, some of which was abolished after Vatican II, while the rest fell into disuse. His papal coronation ran for the traditional five hours Pope Paul VI, by contrast, opted for a shorter ceremony, while later popes declined to be crowned. Pope John XXIII, like his predecessor Pius XII, chose to have the coronation itself take place on the balcony of St. Peter's Basilica, in view of the crowds assembled in St. Peter's Square below. He wore a number of papal tiaras during his papacy. On the most formal of occasions would he don the 1877 Palatine tiara he received at his coronation, but on other occasions, he used the 1922 tiara of Pope Pius XI, which was used so often that it was associated with him quite strongly. Like those before him, he was bestowed with an expensive silver tiara by the people of Bergamo. John XXIII requested that the number of jewels used be halved and that the money be given to the poor. Topic. Liturgical reform Maintaining continuity with his predecessors, John XXIII continued the gradual reform of the Roman liturgy, and published changes that resulted in the 1962 Roman Missal, the last typical edition containing the Tridentine Mass established in 1570 by Pope Pius V at the request of the Council of Trent. Topic. Beatifications and canonization ceremonies 
John the 23rd beatified four individuals in his reign: Elena Guerra, the 26th of April 1959; Inocenzo da Berzo, the 12th of November 1961; Elizabeth Ann Seton, the 17th of March 1963; and Luigi Maria Palazzolo, the 19th of March 1963. He also canonized a small number of individuals. He canonized Charles of Sezi and Joaquina Vedrina de Moss on the 12th of April 1959, Gregorio Barbarigo on the 26th of May 1960, Juan de Ribera on the 12th of June 1960, Maria Bertilla Biscardin on the 11th of May 1961, Martin de Porres on the 6th of May 1962, and Antonio Maria Pucci, Francis Mary of Camporoso, and Peter Julian Amard on the 9th of December 1962. His final canonization was that of Vincent Pelotti on the 20th of January 1963. Topic: <inaudible> Doctor of the Church. John the 23rd proclaimed Saint Lawrence of Brindisi as a Doctor of the Church on the 19th of March 1959. Topic: <inaudible> Vatican II, the first session. On the 11th of October 1962, the first session of the Second Vatican Council was held in the Vatican. He gave the Gaudet Mater Ecclesia speech, which served as the opening address for the Council. The day was basically electing members for several Council commissions that would work on the issues presented in the Council. On that same night following the conclusion of the first session, the people in St. Peter's Square chanted and yelled with the sole objective of getting John XXIII to appear at the window to address them. Pope John XXIII did indeed appear at the window and delivered a speech to the people below, and told them to return home and hug their children, telling them that it came from the Pope. This speech would later become known as the so-called Speech of the Moon. The first session ended in a solemn ceremony on 8 December 1962 with the next session scheduled to occur in 1963 from 12 May to 29 June. This was announced on 12 November 1962. John XXIII's closing speech made subtle references to Pope Pius IX, and he had expressed the desire to see Pius IX beatified and eventually canonized. In his journal in 1959 during a spiritual retreat, John XXIII made this remark, I always think of Pius IX of holy and glorious memory, and by imitating him in his sacrifices, I would like to be worthy to celebrate his canonization. Topic. Final months and death On 23 September 1962, Pope John XXIII was diagnosed with stomach cancer. The diagnosis, which was kept from the public, followed nearly eight months of occasional stomach hemorrhages, and reduced the pontiff's appearances. Looking pale and drawn during these events, he gave a hint to his ultimate fate in April 1963, when he said to visitors, that which happens to all men perhaps will happen soon to the Pope who speaks to you today." Pope John XXIII offered to mediate between U.S. President John F. Kennedy and Nikita Khrushchev during the Cuban Missile Crisis in October 1962. Both men applauded the Pope for his deep commitment to peace. Khrushchev would later send a message via Norman Cousins and the letter expressed his best wishes for the Pontiff's ailing health. John XXIII personally typed and sent a message back to him, thanking him for his letter. Cousins, meanwhile, traveled to New York City and ensured that John would become Time Magazine's Man of the Year. John XXIII became the first pope to receive the title, followed by John Paul II in 1994 and Francis in 2013. On 10 February 1963, John XXIII officially opened the process of beatification for the late Cardinal Andrea Carlo Ferrari, Archbishop of Milan from 1894 to 1921. This conferred upon him the title of Servant of God. On 7 March 1963, the Feast of the University's patron St. Thomas Aquinas, Pope John XXIII visited the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, Angelicum and with the motu proprio Dominicanus Ordo, raised the Angelicum to the rank of Pontifical University. Thereafter it would be known as the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas in the city. On 10 May 1963, John XXIII received the Balzan Prize in private at the Vatican but deflected achievements of himself to the five popes of his lifetime, Pope Leo XIII to Pius XII. 
On the 11th of May, the Italian president Antonio Segni officially awarded Pope John XXIII with the Balzan Prize for his engagement for peace. While in the car en route to the official ceremony, he suffered great stomach pains but insisted on meeting with Segni to receive the award in the Quirinal Palace, refusing to do so within the Vatican. He stated that it would have been an insult to honor a pontiff on the remains of the crucified Saint Peter. It was the Pope's last public appearance. On 25 May 1963, the Pope suffered another hemorrhage and required several blood transfusions, but the cancer had perforated the stomach wall and peritonitis soon set in. The doctors conferred in a decision regarding this matter and John XXIII's aide Loris F. Capavilla broke the news to him saying that the cancer had done its work and nothing could be done for him. Around this time, his remaining siblings arrived to be with him. By 31 May, it had become clear that the cancer had overcome the resistance of John XXIII, it had left him confined to his bed. At 11 a.m. Petrus Canisius van Lierde as papal sacristan was at the bedside of the dying pope, ready to anoint him. The pope began to speak for the very last time. I had the great grace to be born into a Christian family, modest and poor, but with the fear of the Lord. My time on earth is drawing to a close. But Christ lives on and continues his work in the church. Souls, souls, ut omnes unum sint, van Lierde then anointed his eyes, ears, mouth, hands and feet. Overcome by emotion, van Lierde forgot the right order of anointing. John XXIII gently helped him before bidding those present a last farewell. John XXIII died of peritonitis caused by a perforated stomach at 1949 local time on 3 June 1963 at the age of 81, ending a historic pontificate of four years and seven months. He died just as a Mass for him finished in St. Peter's Square below, celebrated by Luigi Traglia. After he died, his brow was ritually tapped to see if he was dead, and those with him in the room said prayers. Then the room was illuminated, thus informing the people of what had happened. He was buried on 6 June in the Vatican grottos. Two wreaths, placed on the two sides of his tomb, were donated by the prisoners of the Regina Celli prison and the Mantova jail in Verona. On the 22nd of June 1963, one day after his friend and successor Pope Paul VI was elected, the latter prayed at his tomb. On 3 December 1963, U.S. President Lyndon B. Johnson posthumously awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the United States' highest civilian award, in recognition of the good relationship between Pope John XXIII and the United States of America. In his speech on 6 December 1963, Johnson said, I have also determined to confer the Presidential Medal of Freedom posthumously on another noble man whose death we mourned six months ago, His Holiness, Pope John XXIII. He was a man of simple origins, of simple faith, of simple charity. In this exalted office he was still the gentle pastor. He believed in discussion and persuasion. He profoundly respected the dignity of man. He gave the world immortal statements of the rights of man, of the obligations of men to each other, of their duty to strive for a world community in which all can live in peace and fraternal friendship. His goodness reached across temporal boundaries to warm the hearts of men of all nations and of all faiths. The citation for the medal reads, His Holiness Pope John XXIII, dedicated servant of God. He brought to all citizens of the planet a heightened sense of the dignity of the individual, of the brotherhood of man, and of the common duty to build an environment of peace for all humankind. <laughs> Beatification and canonization He was known affectionately as, Good Pope John. His cause for canonization was opened under Pope Paul VI during the final session of the Second Vatican Council on 18 November 1965, along with the cause of Pope Pius XII. On 3 September 2000, John XXIII was declared, Blessed, alongside Pope Pius IX by Pope John Paul II. The penultimate step on the road to sainthood after a miracle of curing an ill woman was discovered. He was the first pope since Pope Pius X to receive this honor. Following his beatification, his body was moved from its original burial place in the grottos below the Vatican to the altar of Saint Jerome and displayed for the veneration of the faithful. At the time, the body was observed to be extremely well preserved, a condition which the Church ascribes to embalming and the lack of air flow in his sealed triple coffin rather than a miracle. When John XXIII's body was moved in 2001, it was once again treated to prevent deterioration. 
The original vault above the floor was removed and a new one built beneath the ground. It was here that the body of Pope John Paul II was entombed from the 9th of April 2005 to April 2011 before being moved for his beatification on the 1st of May 2011. The 50th anniversary of his death was celebrated on the 3rd of June 2013 by Pope Francis, who visited his tomb and prayed there, then addressing the gathered crowd and spoke about the late pope. The people that gathered there at the tomb were from Bergamo, the province where the late Pope came from. A month later, on 5 July 2013, Francis approved Pope John XXIII for canonization, along with Pope John Paul II without the traditional second miracle required. Instead, Francis based this decision on John XXIII's merits for the Second Vatican Council. On Sunday, the 27th of April 2014, John the 23rd and Pope John Paul II were declared saints on Divine Mercy Sunday. The date assigned for the liturgical celebration of John the 23rd is not the 3rd of June, the anniversary of his death, as would be usual, but the 11th of October, the anniversary of his opening of the Second Vatican Council. He is also commemorated in the Anglican Church of Canada, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and some other organizations with a feast day of 4 June, changed originally from 3 June. Topic legacy from his teens When he entered the seminary, he maintained a diary of spiritual reflections that was subsequently published as the Journal of a Soul. The collection of writings charts Rincali's goals and his efforts as a young man to grow in holiness and continues after his election to the papacy. It remains widely read. The opening titles of Pier Paolo Pasolina's film The Gospel According to St. Matthew 1964 dedicate the film to the memory of John the 23rd. John the 23rd College, Perth, in Western Australia is a Catholic school named after John the 23rd. Pope John Senior High School and Junior Seminary in Koforidua, Ghana and the Catholic Learning Community of John XXIII, a primary school in Sydney. Rincali College is located in Timaru, New Zealand. There are also Rincali High Schools in Indianapolis, Indiana, Aberdeen, South Dakota, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and Omaha, Nebraska. Topic see also Cardinals created by John XXIII Central Preparatory Commission Eastern Catholic Churches Eastern Orthodox Church List of Catholic Saints List of Encyclicals of Pope John XXIII List of Meetings Between the Pope and the President of the United States List of Popes List of Righteous Among the Nations by Country Topic Notes Topic References Topic Further reading Bono, Bernard R. Pope John XXIII. An Astute, Pastoral Leader 1980, 316 pp. Cahill, Thomas. Pope John XXIII, A Penguin Life 2002, 241 pp. Dunn, Dennis J. The Vatican's Ostpolitik, Past and Present, Journal of International Affairs 1982-36 No. 2, 247-255, online Hebelthwaite, Peter. Pope John XXIII, Shepherd of the Modern World 1985, 550 pp. Hebelthwaite, Peter and Hebelthwaite, Margaret 2000. John XXIII, Pope of the Council. Continuum International. ISBN 978-0-8264-4995-5. Martin, Malachi 1972, Three Popes and the Cardinal, The Church of Pius, John and Paul in its Encounter with Human History, Farrar, Strauss and Giroux, ISBN 978-0-374-27675-1. Vatican, A Novel. New York, Harper and Row. ISBN 978-0-06-015478-3. 1990. The Keys of This Blood. New York, Simon & Schuster. ISBN 978-0-671-69174-5. Reeves, Gunner John XXIII Simple and Humble A Blessed Man. Privileged Testimonies. ISBN 978-93-5015-077-1. Williams, Paul L. 2003. The Vatican Exposed. Amherst, N.Y., Prometheus Books. ISBN 978-1-59102-065-3. Wilsford, David, ed., Political Leaders of Contemporary Western Europe, A Biographical Dictionary Greenwood, 1995 pp 203-207, Zizola, Giancarlo, Berolini, Helen. Utopia of Pope John XXIII 1979, 379 pp. 
Topic primary sources Coppa, Frank J. The National Edition of the Diaries of Angelo Giuseppe Rincalli, Pope John XXIII, A Bibliographical Essay, The Catholic Historical Review 97 No. 1 2011, pp. 81–92 Online Rincalli, Angelo Giuseppe 1965, Giovanni 23 Il Giornale del Anima Journal of a Soul, White, Dorothy Trans, Jeffrey Chapman, ISBN 978-0-225-6689 Five, excerpt, his Spiritual Diary. Topic external links Wikilivres has original media or text related to this article, Pope John XXIII in the public domain in South Korea works by or about Pope John XXIII at Internet Archive Rincalli, Angelo Giuseppe, Opera Omnia complete works in Latin, EU, Documenta Catholica Omnia. Rockwell, Lou, John XXIII was embalmed, Vatican denies he is subject of miracle of incorruptibility. Washtilla, Carol Joseph, the 3rd of September 2000, Pope John the 23rd Beatification Mass, Homily, Rome, et, Vatican, archived from the original on the 26th of October 2006. John the 23rd, Pope John the 23rd Biography, Rome, et, Vatican. John the 23rd, Everything Too. Pope John the 23rd, Atheism Biography, about. John the 23rd, Pope, Britannica Encyclopedia, online ed. Advocating John the 23rd as righteous among the nations, Raoul Wallenberg. John the 23rd, Monuments, St. Peter's Basilica. John the 23rd, Memorial, Find a Grave. Pope John the 23rd, Intra Text, Text with Concordances and Frequency List. Saint of the Day, American Catholic, the 11th of October 2016. Pope John the 23rd, News Archive, UK, Pathé. Pope John the 23rd Time magazine the 4th of January 1963 Texts for the Liturgy of the Hours for the Optional Memorial of Saint John the 23rd Latin English TR still not published